All right, we are underway. This is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, I'm a professor of economics and of international and public affairs at Brown University. Uh, the Watson Institute here at Brown sponsors The Glenn Show. And I'm with John McWhorter. And John McWhorter is a professor of the humanities at Columbia University and a frequent conversation partner of mine here at The Glenn Show. We are the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. And we got our work cut out for us today, John. Yeah. <laughs> this is this thing that we've been kind of teasing everybody with over the past few weeks, but we're going to do it today. All right. So I don't know. Maybe it was uh, two months ago I said that we had this blockbuster topic and you guys needed to stay tuned, whoever is still listening to us out there in uh, Blogging Heads land. Uh, you guys need to stay tuned because we were going to really set the world on fire with a conversation about a topic that you just couldn't believe it was so hot. And then come time to talk about it, we weaseled out. We weaseled out uh, under the uh, you know uh, excuse that it was just like unspeakable. It was like something that you know even to talk about what we couldn't talk about would be to be talking too much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use the uh, the metaphor or the analogy of uh, a UFO sighting. I said, suppose you and I had been <laughs> walking in Central Park or whatever, <laughs> a nice intellectual conversation, and we saw a flying saucer come down from the sky, <laughs> land, little green men get out, walk up to us, shake our hands, get back and fly away. Would we tell anybody about it? And uh, of course, on the one hand, you want to tell because it's kind of exciting and interesting. On the other hand, you don't want people to think you're absolutely and totally nuts. You don't think they're going to believe a word you say, and so you don't say anything at all. And that was like the cover story on why we weren't talking about what we couldn't tell people that we weren't talking about. Yeah. And so we've been holding <laughs> off and talking about it amongst ourselves, and I guess thinking that the facts weren't dependable enough for us to talk about this constructively. But it's gone to the point where the general media is getting a hold of this. I think you want to tell them what it is, or should I? We have reason to think that unless you really read around, you might get a distorted or rather edited picture of the truth of this. So I figure it's time for us to talk about it. And Glenn, you agree, and so we've decided. So Glenn, you you. Well, now that we build it up so much. Okay. What is okay. This? So anybody uh, with access to the outside world will know that uh, George Zimmerman, uh, the uh, perpetrator of a shooting which re, uh, resulted in the death of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida in 2012, George Zimmerman, the killer of Trayvon Martin, has filed a $100 million lawsuit. Let's not put too much weight on that $100 million. That's laughable. They'll never collect it, even if they win uh, every case. He'll get but $25. Any, yeah. It's meant to be sensational. He's filed a lawsuit, or I rather I should say Larry Clayman, his lawyer, has filed this lawsuit. Clayman, K-L-A-Y-M-A-N. He is uh, a founder of Judicial Watch. This is a right-wing legal activism organization. I don't think Clayman is any longer associated with it, but he nevertheless is one of these uh, conservative legal activist lawyers who goes into court and tries to bring provocative cases uh, to push the law and the public discussion in the direction of his values, which are conservative. Larry Clayman is bringing the suit on behalf of George Zimmerman uh, in court in Florida, suing the Trayvon Martin family, that would be Tracy Martin, Trayvon's father, and Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon's mother suing uh, Rachel Gentrell, if I pronounce her name. Gen correctly. Gentel. Gentel, wait, Rachel Gentel, or should they, do they say Gentel? I Probably wonder. Gentel, Haitian. Yeah, uh, yeah, who was a witness uh, in the Trayvon Martin uh, case. And also, if I'm not mistaken, suing uh, the prosecutors uh, who uh, were bringing the case against George Zimmerman in court in Florida. Benjamin Crump. Uh, for mm -hmm. And Benjamin Trump, very importantly, who had been the lawyer representing the Martin family in their public relations campaign uh, oriented toward uh, bringing about uh, charges and uh, against George Zimmerman, criminal charges. So we should explain this more fully, and I will in a moment. 
Um, but uh, Zimmerman is bringing this lawsuit. The lawsuit alleges that uh, the uh, case brought against uh, Zimmerman was built on a hoax, was built on, was grounded on a false witness, someone who was presented to the court as uh, having been on the telephone with Trayvon Martin. At great before, length. Moments before he was shot. Mm -hmm. His girlfriend had a long-term uh, close relationship with Trayvon Martin, and she shared at trial evidence which was uh, materially uh, relevant to uh, the case that the prosecution was bringing against uh, George Zimmerman. Uh, the issue at question was whether or not Zimmerman had followed Trayvon Martin and initiated the altercation between themselves, which is what the prosecution alleged, or whether Trayvon Martin had jumped Zimmerman and sucker punched him, pinned him to the ground and was pummeling him, and then Zimmerman uh, discharged his weapon in defense of his life, killing Trayvon Martin, which is- what, Out of desperation, right. Out of yeah. des which is what the defense was alleging. And therefore, someone who had been on the phone with Trayvon Martin moments before he was uh, killed, who talked of uh, what Martin had had to say at that time, which was this weird dude is following me, I don't know what he wants, et cetera, was pertinent to the case that was being brought. The allegation uh, that this lawsuit is now making, and this is seven years plus after the event in question, six years after the trial, um, the allegation is that uh, the person who was on the phone with Trayvon Martin at that time, his girlfriend, was not the woman who actually appeared in court and testified to the effect that she was Trayvon's girlfriend and was on the phone with him. That they substituted a fake witness because they could not get the real woman to testify to the uh, events in question. In the way Rachel, Rachel Gentel was apparently, allegedly, the half-sister of the actual girlfriend in question and who His had been name is Diamond Eugene Reynolds. Right. Uh, that's the actual girlfriend and the woman who was on the phone with Trayvon Martin, on the phone with him for hundreds of minutes on the day that he was killed. And did a phone interview with Benjamin Crump, which if you followed the case, you heard, and that voice was oddly different from the voice of Rachel Gentel, who was later on the stand. Before a journalist for one of the major news outlets, Benjamin Trump had a conversation with the girlfriend of Trayvon Martin, who was uh, allegedly on the telephone with Trayvon before he was shot. And he taped it and he played some of the tape in front of a press conference. Uh, and uh, this is before Zimmerman had been charged. This was during the period when the family and their advocate, Benjamin Trump, were advocating to have charges brought. We're accusing the authorities in Florida of going easy on George Zimmerman and of, in effect, covering up what had been a murder because upon initial inquiry, the authorities had elected not to bring charges against Zimmerman, had taken uh, his account of what had happened more or less at face value as a self-defense act uh, with which I imagine the evidence at hand for them was consistent. Uh, but advocates uh, were uh, dissatisfied with this decision to not arrest Zimmerman, the killer of Trayvon Martin. And a campaign was undertaken to, petitions were um, distributed. Um, I mean, many, many people, I mean, I think millions of people actually uh, signed on to affirm the demand that the authorities arrest Zimmerman and bring him to justice. So in fact, he was arrested, brought to justice, tried, put in jeopardy of loss of liberty, he was acquitted at the end of the day, but uh, he's alleging injury. Okay, now, took me a long time to say that, and I hope I got it more or less right. I'm not, you know, absolutely an expert on the facts, and they get a little complicated of this case, but I think I've got the picture broadly correct. Now, there is a, where is the evidence that this uh, switcheroo took place? Okay, it comes from the investigative reporting of a filmmaker called Joel Gilbert. Okay. Joel Gilbert is a documentary filmmaker. You can look him up. Uh, he has a film now that has been produced and is in distribution uh, called The Trayvon Hoax. He is the one who makes the case that Rachel- Glenn, if I can interrupt very briefly. Yes, he of makes course. a very meticulous case. 
This is not some pamphlet of 45 pages. He makes a very lawyerly and frankly, almost astonishingly diligent case about this. Anyway, go ahead, Glenn. Well, no, that's exactly where I'm headed. You're, you're, you're right to say that I agree with that. Uh, he makes this case in this film uh, that uh, Rachel, Rachel Jontel was in fact not Trayvon Martin's girlfriend, that she was someone that the uh, prosecuting team put forward uh, because they didn't have it, the real uh, uh, witness to uh, put before the court. Uh, because the real witness, nobody's exactly sure why Diamond Eugene did not testify, but it's reasonable to guess that she did not want to go before the court telling an untruth. Because what Rachel Gentile was coached to say is not consonant with the actual evidence of what apparently went on between Zimmerman and Martin. But she's never said so herself. She hasn't spoken. We can't know another reason. And I hope this isn't it, but it might be that she was actually also seeing another gentleman at the time. And she knew that if she testified about this, that person would find out. We'll probably never know why Diamond Eugene did not take the stand. But Rachel Gentel is her half sister and her family apparently arranged with Crump's knowledge to put her up there and to recite a story. Anyway, go ahead. I know, you, you're telling the tale, man. Uh, and Gilbert lays this out. That's where you got this from. And uh, in, this, in this documentary film, and as you point out, he lays it out meticulously. In other words, he gets all of the telephone records of Trayvon Martin, and he goes through them, and all of the text messages, and he goes through them, and there are thousands upon thousands of them. He goes around and he interviews everybody. He goes to the high schools in Miami where uh, uh, Diamond Eugene Reynolds and Trayvon Martin matriculated, and he interviews Looks in people. the yearbooks. Yeah. He goes through the yearbooks and he looks at the pictures. He does all this detective work. He hunts down this hidden uh, figure who is Diamond Eugene Reynolds, the girlfriend of Trayvon Martin who refused to cooperate with the prosecution and who was substituted for by Rachel Gentel. He hunts her down and uh, finds her. Uh, she is a... Uh, Selling her own clothes. Yeah, a she has, she's a fashion designer who puts out her own swimsuits and stuff like that online. And he spends thousands of dollars on her wares. And because he's such a good customer of her business, she agrees to meet him. And he has her on camera, et cetera. OK? And he also, Glenn, remember, remember, he gets a handwriting sample from her and looks at handwriting samples of all of these people to figure out exactly who was who, such as who wrote the statement about what happened that night in a certain kind of handwriting. And then it's signed in different handwriting, Rachel Gentel claims that her nickname was Diamond Eugene. This is something you could have seen at the time. And you can't help but let some weird details pass when you're taking something in. But why would somebody's name, who is Rachel Gentel, have the nickname Diamond Eugene? That doesn't make sense. It's because Diamond Eugene is a different person. And we should say also, Glenn, that the, some of the methods that Gilbert used to get this information were a little... A little sleazy, like for example, Diamond Eugene didn't know who this man was. She didn't no, he know. Thought, he, she thought he was a customer buying her uh, swimwear for right. his girlfriend. Right. And you know, all these text messages, as you can imagine, a lot of them display some of the seamier sides of these people. And Gilbert, you know, rather, you know, almost revels in it. I found actually these people were some of the most articulate texters. I've ever seen. <laughs> Some of the things make me think, boy, I've said in a TED talk that texting is a different language. Boy, does all of this prove it. But the fact is, there's a certain issue of privacy. But nevertheless, the fact is, he has outlined what is almost certainly a factual case, however you feel about him tricking Diamond Eugene in that way. So, well, okay. I mean, we're not proceeding in a particularly systematic man method manner here, but that's quite okay. Uh, the, the, here's what I was trying to get our audience to understand. Gilbert contacted you and I, and me, uh, and uh, made us aware of his film. And uh, you viewed it, and I viewed it. And, and we both read the book. book. Uh, and he wrote a book, yeah. He I sent us the book. Here. I hope I it's read okay the book if I first. show it to people. Right. Yeah. Uh, oops. Uh, this is the yeah. book by Joel Gilbert on the Trayvon Martin hoax in which he recounts in prose the narrative that he develops in his film. Uh, now, uh, he contacted us because he wanted us to uh, be aware of what he was doing and to help him publicize it. And you and I thought, okay, who is this Joel Gilbert? And so we did a little research. And it Glenn did out, the research. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> okay, I did a little research. I have to do the research because 
the guy is saying that a narrative which has uh, been embraced by essentially everybody about what happened in Sanford, Florida in February of 2012 to Trayvon Martin, which was that he was gunned down by a white racist, uh, racially profiling uh, vigilante who confronted him that he was desperate just trying to get an iced tea and a bag Gittles. of Skittles to go back and watch the NBA All-Star game uh, while he was visiting at the home of his father's girlfriend in Sanford, Florida, although he lived um, mainly in Miami, um, and that he was confronted by this neighborhood watch vigilante and hounded down and, and shot, shot in cold blood, murdered, unarmed, no threat to anybody, a child, quote unquote. Okay. Zimmerman's narrative was very, very different. Zimmerman's narrative was he, he was doing his job as a neighborhood watch person. He saw somebody, Trayvon Martin, who looked suspicious uh, and uh, attracted his attention. He was uh, monitoring this person and trying to stay in touch with the uh, uh, non-emergency call line with the police department uh, in, in his town, uh, and that uh, Trayvon Martin turned on him, sucker punched him, got him down onto the ground and was pounding him. His head was bouncing off of the concrete. He felt he was getting ready to lose consciousness. He remembered just as he was getting ready to go under that he had a weapon. He pulls the weapon, he, which he claims Trayvon Martin was trying to get, and then he discharges it and Martin is killed. The police bought his story, but uh, the public, uh, after uh, due uh, effort on uh, behalf of the Martin family from Benjamin Crump and a, a largely sympathetic press, came in full time to have grave doubts about his story, and the authorities were, uh, in effect, pressured into bringing charges against Zimmerman, uh, which were brought. But here was what I was trying to say. We found the film persuasive. I don't know if it's true or false. I have no independent evidence. I have no way of judging the veracity of the claims that Gilbert makes. All I can tell you is that when I watched the film, I thought at the end of the day, damn, this could be right. Mm -hmm. This is really, I mean, for example, you get to know Trayvon Martin when you read all of his text messages. We have to be careful here. Keep going. Because you, you, you know, know what, him a little bit. what everybody's going to say is, why did he have to be a perfect victim? But go ahead. No, no, no. That's not what I was getting at. There what right. I was getting at was that he's a player. He's a very popular kid. He's a star socially. He has a lot of friends. He has a lot of girlfriends. We learn a lot about Trayvon Martin. It becomes implausible when you look at the film to think that the woman who's on the stand, who's been represented as his girlfriend, is actually his girlfriend. She simply doesn't have the... Uh, swagger. She doesn't have the cachet. I mean, she doesn't look Glenn, like his girlfriend, man. I, mean, Glenn, I, we, I have to interject that. Okay, you got to interject. There's, there are some people who are going to say that it isn't fair, that we just assume that heavy, quiet Rachel Gentel could not have been involved with tall, handsome, popular Trayvon. However, it is reasonable to question whether she would be his choice. And there's something else about it, too, which is that if any of you followed the case, and I, I certainly did, Gentel seemed oddly disconnected and uncomfortable on the stand. And I was the first person to defend her speech. There were people who claimed that she sounded like yeah. she didn't grow up speaking English when she was just speaking black English. I wrote pieces about that. Yeah. And so it wasn't her speech. And of course, maybe this teenager would be a little uncomfortable on the stand, but Gentel seemed really almost spaced out. And that was just a little hair out of place that I certainly just kind of let go over the years. But it turns out there's a reason that she seems so utterly uncomfortable and often clueless, and it's because she wasn't there. She was reporting about something that she had not actually witnessed. To believe Gilbert and all that he's reconstructed, including the cell phone records, suddenly makes sense of the fact that that person on the stand never seemed like she actually knew what she was talking about. Now we know it's because she wasn't the girl. Anyway, now you're right to chastise me a little bit for the, you know, yeah. uh, uh, body shaming and all that. Yeah. It's it's the cumulative effect of a lot of different things. Yes. What you say, including the fact that there was a letter introduced into evidence in the trial that had been written by Diamond Eugene to Sabrina Fulton, Trace, uh, Trayvon Martin's mother. 
uh, conveying condolences. I was on the phone with your son just before he was killed. I know the loss must be terrible to you, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to write and reach out to you. Signed, Diamond, uh, Diamond Eugene, uh, which Rachel Gentel testified was her letter. But when she was asked to actually read the letter in court, she couldn't do so because the letter was written in cursive handwriting. And she said she didn't read cursive which means she didn't write cursive. She supposedly dictated the letter, mm -hmm. signed it Diamond Eugene, which she claimed to be a nickname. Right. It turns out that that was also the actual name of the woman who Gilbert tracks down to have been the actual girlfriend. And, this is also and why would she dictate it? Right. Like, why would you dictate something so important? You would so, you know, the cumulative own. effect of the relative plausibility of a lot of different pieces of evidence that Gilbert marshals leaves, I think, an objective viewer scratching his or her head and thinking, darn, could this be right? It's not obviously wrong. Okay. Yes. So, I want to get that on the record. Yeah. However, the filmmaker Joel Gilbert is also the director of this okay this i hope everybody yeah. can see it this is the jacket cover of a dvd of a film that joe gilbert has made you read correctly dreams from my real father you see correctly barack hussein obama flanked by junior flanked by barack obama senior and on one hand his purported father, according to Joel Gilbert, and by Frank Marshall Davis, and a member of the Communist Party USA, uh, <laughs> a, an African-American friend of the family of uh, Stanley Eugene Dunham, Brock's mother. Mother. Brock's mother's father and Frank Marshall Davis were good friends. And the claim of this documentary made by the same guy is that, in fact, this fellow is the father of Barack Obama. But it would have been inconvenient to uh, an embarrassed uh, family of Stanley Ann Dunham when she became pregnant by this guy and to the future biography of the man who became the first black president in the United States that he was the son out of wedlock of an American communist uh, rogue. And so a narrative was invented. This is the claim of this documentary film, okay? And you know, Glenn, we should say that in evaluating all of this, part of the reason that we hesitated is because, you know, Joel Gilbert is someone who has a thesis that Barack Obama's biography is that kind of a fraud, and he sincerely believes that and Joel Gilbert's reasons for writing this book, it's not only a film, it's a book that gives you more detail than a film possibly can about this Trayvon Martin case is that he has a bee in his bonnet about an idea that the Trayvon Martin case symbolizes the state of race relations in this country and that that case in particular was the beginning of a whole new period and the people have exploited Trayvon Martin, such as Andrew Gillum down in Florida, has exploited supposedly Trayvon Martin for his own ends. He is disgusted by Barack Obama having said that if I had a son, he would have looked like Trayvon. So this is not to impugn Joel Gilbert's character, but to say that this is the side of the spectrum that he does come from, and Glenn and I are very much aware of it. And nevertheless, there's an equipoise that we find ourselves having to muster in that, I don't know about you, Glenn, but I would say that just viscerally, I don't want anybody trashing Barack Obama. I find Gilbert's analysis of race relations as based on Democrats cynically using the Trayvon Martin case to keep their power. I find that oversimplified and unconvincing, although the Martin case was the beginning of something new. Nevertheless, the case that he lays out, I'm a linguist, you're an economist. We're not trained lawyers, neither of us are journalists, but I dare anybody to watch that film or particularly to read the book and not find themselves wondering and not just thinking it makes you think and then going on and thinking what you thought before. Gilbert lays out a really damning case that there really was a Trayvon hoax. And I'm willing to put myself on the line and say that even if it turns out not to be true. And I get the feeling, Glenn, you'd feel the same way that something's up 
here. Well, the thing that is, I, I agree with what you just said, John, certainly not to endorse Joel Gilbert's politics or his sort of larger uh, view about social dynamics and racial dynamics in American society. Although I must say, I don't disagree with everything that Joel Gilbert thinks. I do think uh, the Trayvon Martin affair played a, an outsized role in the dynamic that led to Black Lives Matter. And I agree. The, the politicization of you know the issue of race and, and policing. Uh, even though George Zimmerman was not a police officer and so on. But but here's the thing that got me exercised. I, I, I get this um, film and book. I watched the film and I skimmed the book. I haven't read the book perhaps as closely as you have. And I, I come to the end of it and I say, darn it, it, it might be true. It's worth taking seriously. Could this be true? It's worth actually looking further. I said, how could it be true? I asked myself, how could this be true? How could it be true that someone who was not the person they were represented as being was put forward by the duly appointed authorities to prosecute people for criminal uh, offenses in uh, an American courtroom uh, and that that went by? I mean, where is the journalistic investigation? How, how come it takes a Joel Gilbert digging through uh, Trayvon Martin's phone records to find this out. If this is true, it should have been discovered long ago. Uh, what about the defense attorneys? Were they not aware of the fact that they were uh, dealing with a witness who was a, et cetera, et cetera? I said, how can this be true? On the other hand, it seemed, it, it seemed plausible. And yet the source of the report is a right-wing uh, <coughs> a journal, uh, uh, investigative journalist filmmaker who makes birther-like accusations about Barack Obama. His father is not who he has been telling you that his father is. Maybe he doesn't know who his father is, but I know who his father is, et cetera. So, so a guy who comes on the Alex Jones show, you know, Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, the guy behind Pizzagate, all this kind of thing, you know, anybody tainted by Alex Jones is obviously a right wing kook whom you can't take seriously. So here I am, I care about race and racial politics. Uh, and so do you. We talk about it all the time. Um, I see the Trayvon Martin thing come and go, and I note the huge impact that it has on American public discourse. Uh, I come in the fullness of time after five years into an experience that leads me to think maybe everything I've thought about this wasn't true, and it was built on a foundation that was false and manipulated <clears throat> and intended to manipulate me and the rest of the public into a particular cast of mind a false narrative about something important that had happened. And I can't rely on ordinary sources of information, mainstream media, investigative reporting, uh, whatever, uh, anything except uh, this guy on the right to tell me what's going on. And, and then I'm afraid to talk about it. I'm, I mean, I'm afraid to tell anybody that I think it might be true. I'm afraid even to mention at my podcast that, I, that I've had these experiences and these thoughts going through my mind. And that makes me think, that the climate that we have stumbled into here in the United States for the discussion of important public issues is um, contaminated by a certain kind of partisanship. On the one hand, you have the president of the United States saying <coughs> fake news, fake news, fake news, anytime something is reported that he doesn't like. Okay, and you've got tens of millions of people tuning into his rallies. And, and being um, convinced and persuaded by the president's denunciation of those people back there, is the way he does it at his rallies. That's uh, good. As, <coughs> our liars see what cheap. Glenn just did physically. It was a very deft, Hirschfeld summation of what Trump does with his finger. But anyway, and, go ahead. And, and you know, 30, 40 million people believe it, okay? And won't, and won't believe anything that they see on MSNBC or CNN or in the New York Times. On the other hand, you have another 30, 40, or 50 million people who, if it came on Fox News, it can't possibly be true. If Sean Hannity uh, credits it, it must be wrong. If David Nunes uh, thinks that it's uh, something worth investigating, well, it had to come from uh, the Russians and it, it, it must be subversive of American interest and whatnot. <clears throat> so I, my fear is, and, I won't, and I'll stop, we're kind of, I, I felt myself personally sucked into this thing of, um, of uh, a uh, absence of any sense of the objective validity of factual claims about political life <clears throat> and a kind of relativism. When I, when, whenever I hear a fact reported and my first question is, well, who's saying that? 
before I'm prepared to believe that it's true, rather than what's the evidence for that, feels to me like we're in trouble. It becomes yeah. very ad hominem. Uh, all of our evaluation of public discourse becomes rooted in, uh, in a prior assessment of where is the person coming from who's telling me this, because I believe anything that's said to me must be in the service of some agenda. If it's my agenda, I'm listening. If it's the other agenda, I'm, I'm tuning out. This kind yeah. of thing. You know, it's this this particular case really does um, change me in many ways and in ways that make me very uncomfortable. And I should specify, Trayvon Martin really was the beginning of the teens when it comes to race relations in America. It was an iconic event because of what social media did to iconicize the whole thing. That was the beginning. The hoodie. Of the, the hoodie. Whole, yeah. I'm the wearing hoodie. a hoodie, you know. Uh, yeah. Something new happened then. But. I don't think that it's about Democrats using it in order to keep as many seats in Congress as possible. But yes, it was an iconic event. And what worries me is that there were always things about that case that didn't quite work if you thought about them objectively, which I was inclined to let by. I should say that I was quite PC about Trayvon back in the day. I wrote things such that when Joel Gilbert wrote me, he wrote me as somebody who he thought likely to resist him. He thought I was on race, just, you know, one of the usual. And if you just read a couple of pieces I wrote back then, then that's what you think. But even then, you know, somebody happened to make a cell phone audio tape of the encounter between Martin and Zimmerman. This tends to get lost. There is audio of what happened between them on that grass. And somebody is screaming. Somebody is yeah. screaming for help. And Trayvon's mother claims that that's his voice screaming for help. But, you know, the truth is, George Zimmerman is a pot-bellied little guy who's five something. Trayvon Martin, despite all those cherubic pictures that we saw at the time, right. was six foot three. Yeah. Are we really, even back then, I was thinking, are we supposed to imagine that somehow that little roly-poly George Zimmerman got the best of this six foot three kid who's then yelling for his life because this man is sitting on his belly? That never made any sense. And so anyway, now here we are, and it turns out I have all reason to believe that what happened was that Zimmerman got out of the car. He did not follow Trayvon Martin. He stopped when he was basically told to by the cops, but was just trying to get a bead on where Trayvon Martin was. Trayvon Martin didn't like that he had been tailed at all, jumped George Zimmerman in the dark and beat him within an inch of his life. And the things that Gilbert reveals about Martin's past it doesn't make him a horrible person that he had been suspended, not just for a little weed, but for being a physically violent person. And that that comes out in his text that he liked himself some fighting. That is what Trayvon Martin was like. That doesn't make him evil. But he was somebody who could have vested George Zimmerman in that way. He was very experienced with his fists. And so that turns out to be what it is. And then Rachel Gentile was a plant. And it has to be important. The issue here is not just some Hitchcock thing where Rachel Gentel wasn't the real person but said what Diamond Eugene would have said. Rachel Gentel told the story of Trayvon Martin being jumped by Zimmerman because she'd been coached to do it. So Rachel Gentel was not only a plant, but she said things that weren't true. And she probably knew it. That's a whole other issue. But the fact is we were given the wrong facts. And what bothers me is that this means something. Trayvon Martin, apparently the first story is nothing like what actually happened. Mike Brown, we get a story, and it turns out that that's not what happened. Jesse Smollett pulls what he pulled earlier this year, and it turns out that he is telling a story. And there are many cases like this. And Glenn, this is, I'm almost done. This is where it's no, gone. these cases are all different. I just want to interject. They're not, you're <laughs> okay. not saying that these cases are the same or similar. You're, you're saying, however, that in each of these cases, we were told a narrative that proved upon consideration not to be true. Yeah, there's a pattern here. And of course, there are cases like this where it absolutely is what it was. Nevertheless, it's interesting that these most prominent cases often are the ones where it turns out we're being lied to, to the point that I have now, as of 2019, opened up to a skepticism that I used to tamp down in myself. There's a case that I don't think is ever gonna make national news that happens to have come to my attention because of aspects of my life and where I've been going. And I'm not gonna mention what it was because the facts aren't in, and frankly, I can tell where this is going. But a couple of months ago, I heard about a case like this where you think, boy, this naked racism in 2019, can you imagine? For the first time, I heard about this in, in what, June. 
for the first time, I found myself allowing myself to think, I'll bet that's not what happened. And with Trayvon Martin, I tamped that down. When I first heard about Ferguson, I tamped it down. With Smollett, I heard about him and I thought, boy, that sounds like something out of a 1970s made for TV movie, but I'm gonna assume that the man is telling the truth. This time I just thought, you know what? I don't think that's what happened. And I can, I'm give it a couple months. And you know what? It's been a couple months and we found out that the person made most of this stuff up. It's a pattern. And so the question becomes, why? are people making up this victimization? You know, what, what is it that drives so many people today to create these stories when life is hard enough as it is? But it's at the point now, as of the Trayvon hoax, I am now skeptical of any claims like this. And I'm open to it turning out to be exactly what it was, like Eric Garner. That's not a, that's not a hoax, that really happened. But it's at the point now where my antennas are up because we've been fooled so many times. And I'm trying to wrap my head around, what is it about the people who watched what happened with Mike Brown and Ferguson? They, they have a sense that they don't want to snitch. I understand that there's this, this resentment of the cops that goes way, way back. I understand that. But then with the Trayvon Martin case, what's going on here is somewhat different, you know, because George Zimmerman wasn't a cop. And so there's this resentment against racism in general and the whole country comes behind it. With Jesse Smollett, it seems that we've been more honest about it. And maybe that's kind of a crack in the plaster. But I'm frustrated because civil rights is not supposed to be about lying. Oh, OK. That was oh, Andy. sorry. That was my, that was my point. <laughs> right. the, to too many lying. of these that's cases are like, lies. Like you know. a, uh, a poster uh, heading. Uh, you ask, why do, we, uh, why do we see these cases? And I have to presume the reason people are doing this is because they anticipate that they're going to be believed. That is to say, there's a kind of demand creating its own supply. There are demand for instances of racial victimization uh, for the purposes of furthering a political narrative. And that induces people to supply instances of racial victimization more so than they would happen uh, without any uh, extraordinary effort, you know. Uh, but if you are prepared in light of these, um, uh, uh, various uh, hoaxes and semi-hoaxes to discount reports of racial victimization. What do you think middle America is going to do? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's at the point where, frankly, there has always been this certain kind of bone deep skepticism among many people, quote unquote, like that. And I've always been inclined to resist it and to explain that, you know, we have to give these cases you know, as much air as we possibly can. But it's at the point where a person like that, who isn't inclined to be nice about these things, is gonna say, look at Trayvon Martin. This is what's gonna push it over. It's gonna be as this gets out. Look at Trayvon Martin, look at Mike Brown, look at Jesse Smollett. All three of those cases relatively recently are ones where we've been lied to. And a certain kind of person tells us that as moral people, we're supposed to kind of allow the legend to be printed rather than the truth. It was supposed to go all John Ford on it. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't hold up. If Trayvon Martin, you know, uh, go ahead. Will, Wilfred Riley, uh, this is a political science guy at uh, Kentucky State University. <coughs> I've had him on the Glenn Show. <coughs> Has a whole book in which he catalogs these racial hoaxes. I mean, they're yep. hundreds of them. Uh, he, he scours all the newspapers around the country and keeps track of various cases and uh, determines that uh, uh, in many, in many, many instances of allegations of racial victimization have proven not to be uh, true upon, um, upon uh, examination. Mm -hmm. It's too often. And I think it's one of those things. Maybe it's something that's inevitable after things really do change. Maybe there's a pendulum swing where it used to be, nobody would have pulled this in 1935, or it would have been much rarer. People are swinging from trees, and you're gonna pretend that somebody attacked you? That would have been utterly inhuman. I'm sure it was extremely rare. It was white people who lied about black people attacking them. But these days, I imagine after things get better, maybe a human weakness, not black weakness, but human weakness will be, that a certain kind of person, in order to get attention or to detract attention from something they did, such as Tawana Brawley having problems with her parents and pretending to have been left in the woods in a bag with feces spread all over her. That's the first one of these cases that got 
a lot of attention. Maybe this is the sort of thing that we're gonna have to expect because black people are human beings just like all people are human beings and you know people do shit. But what, wor what worries me is that these cases get so heavily publicized and fellow travelers with black people insist on not subjecting cases like this to the proper scrutiny, such as the Trayvon case, where there were so many things that clearly didn't make sense, and yet what everybody wanted to do was wear hoodies and carry Skittles and talk about how racist America still is. That's the problem, that these things, especially with social media, can get so much attention and shape people's view of what the whole country is like. You know, Tawana Brawley couldn't do that because there was no social media yet. Nevertheless, it didn't make us look very good. No, I think that's the beginning of wisdom to start analyzing what the structural foundations in terms of interpersonal communication and, uh, you know, public representation, what are the foundations of this kind of phenomenon? And I agree that uh, the ability of people to network and communicate quickly uh, over large distances and to respond to each other, uh, the, the, the phenomenon of things going viral and becoming events simply because people are talking about them and the talking is the event and a disconnect between the talking and objective reality becomes possible. I, I think this is all a part of the mix. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things. I mean, this is terrible to the extent that this kind of <coughs> proliferates uh, because A, it's a terrible indictment of journalism. It is. Uh, all of these quote hoaxes, close quote, could be and should have been exposed from the get-go uh, by a uh, sober, objective press. Instead of there being a kind of cheerleading frenzy to pile on to a narrative uh, that uh, is uh, evidence of either a virtue signaling that I'm, I'm woke to what's going on in America now, or just a kind of crass, partisan, uh, you know, our side versus their side, and we're going to win. Uh, so um, think about these entrepreneurs. Think about the Al Sharptons of the world. I'm talking about people who take the raw material of a tragedy and massage it into a platform of national publicity and personal aggrandizement. Think about Benjamin Crump. He's got a book out there now called Open Season, the title, Open Season on Black People, where, you know, it's uh, the phenomenon in America now is that they're murdering Black people uh, at will and uh, you know, there's uh, no accountability for it. And then he can tick off the uh, cases of which uh, Trayvon Martin is a leading uh, example. Uh, and and I, I'm sorry for the way this sounds, I really am, because I mean no ill will toward Benjamin Crump, or for that matter, no, you won't believe it, toward Al Sharpton. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I feel offended when I feel manipulated by the machinations of these actors who know full well what they're doing. OK, you're feeding the press in a way to try to induce a certain kind of public reaction. You're trying to control the narrative. This is very clear in the case of Trayvon Martin. There was a strategy. There was a media communications strategy. The ear witness was a part of that strategy. The representation of Skittles and an iced tea, a boy. He's just a boy. He's standing six feet three and he's taking March. <laughs> It's martial arts training, but he's just a boy. You know, he's a kid. Michael Brown is a gentle giant. He's on his way to college, okay? And, and moreover, moreover, anyone who speaks against the narrative once this ball gets rolling places themselves in personal jeopardy of uh, having their reputations besmirched, of being thought ill of. Why would you, and people are going to say this about us right now, even bother to discuss it? People will say, whatever, whatever, whatever. Suppose the facts are exactly what you say they are. Why would you even take the time to discuss this? What are you trying to accomplish? Whose side are you on? You're giving <laughs> aid and comfort to enemies. Only a self-hating Black person would doubt the narrative about Trayvon Martin. The narrative is now playing a role independent of the truth or falsity of its claims. It's playing a stand-in role representing the larger phenomenon of uh, racial domination and brutality and stand your ground stuff and whatnot. I'm still talking, mm -hmm. so I don't know if John is with us. Wait, John may come back. I'm coming right back. He's back. Okay. So so there's, there's a lot at stake, and I just want to finish this, man. 
The President of the United States, that's Barack Hussein Obama, said in 2012, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. He said, I'm mainly concerned about the parents. He's thinking about Sabrina Fulton and he's thinking about Tracy Martin, the parents of Trayvon Martin. And he says, reaching out to them, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. That's the president of the United States. This is long before any facts are actually known. This is in the same wake of narrative manipulation that uh, that uh, the uh, uh, advocates, in this case, Benjamin Crump and company, were uh, fostering. And that's the president of the United States. The awesome influence of that office led to a narrative. We have to understand, Black people are pissed. They're poor relations with the police. One of the reasons for that is that Black people are profiled. Was Trayvon Martin actually profiled? Dare I even raise the question? Mm -hmm. OK. If I tell you that I learned something about Trayvon Martin's associates and about the fact that he was going online looking to try to purchase a weapon, I learned this from Joel Gilbert, now I'm calling him a thug. Now, now, now I'm getting in bed with Dinesh D'Souza and company. You, you know what I mean? In terms of uh, creating this kind of uh, white supremacist, racist backlash. So, so the capacity to keep in touch with reality slips slowly from our fingers. We become uh, the uh, subjects of this you know, puppet show where people are moving these things back and forth. And I can't quite see the strings, and I don't know what's going on behind it. But I'm in the sway of this drama that's being played out before me. And I'm a lemming. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> of, you know, and, and I can't live like that. So I, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's very, yeah. very bad. And I, just finally, you're right. The civil rights movement can't be built on lies. If you want to make a real moral argument that has political effect in this country, you can't base it upon hoaxes, lies, and, and ruses. It's got to be rooted in uh, objective uh, validity. How, otherwise, uh, you're going to uh, end up with your 30% on your side, but you won't be able to persuade anybody of anything. And what worries me also is that um, I'm not sure that people understand the condescension involved in this. And this is a big theme of mine because it's important. Another case we're forgetting about is the, um, the Duke lacrosse case, where a woman you know, unjustly accused these lacrosse players of hideous deeds. And a group of professors wrote this noble document in condemnation, including Houston Baker, who's no fan of either one of us, and never you know, was taken to account for that document and all of the hasty conclusions that it came to. But it comes down to something like this. You know, Rachel Gentel says that her nickname is Diamond Eugene. Now imagine if the issue were the great blue wall of silence and there's a white cop who's accused of doing something horrible to a black man or woman. And a note is involved and the cop's name is Darren Wilson. And there's a note that he <laughs> claims to have written, except that the note is signed something like Harold you know, Jones. And someone says, well, why does it sign Harold Jones? And Darren Wilson says, well, my nickname is Harold Jones. MSNBC, the nation, would jump right on it. There would be no question. They'd shake it like a rabid dog. But if Rachel Gentel says that her nickname is Diamond Eugene, well, what are they thinking? That that's a black thing? To have nicknames that have nothing to do with your original name? Nobody wanted to actually think about any of this that hard. And what that means is that there is a tacit idea that when it comes to the truth, when it comes to maybe exactness with black people, somehow it's different. When it comes to moral <laughs> responsibility, you can write any old thing about these white lacrosse players. You can make them sound like the devil's spawn. And when it turns out it was all a lie, nothing is said to you. Of course, you keep your job, but nothing's even said to you. Nobody rubs anything in your face. It's just as if it never happened. That's dehumanizing to Black people. And I'm not sure if people really think about what that means. The idea that we're not supposed to think about what really happened in Ferguson, but we're supposed to just think about the larger symbolic, you know, as if everything is a novel by Toni Morrison. That is extremely, <laughs> extremely condescending. And I think that it's time that we were held to account. And maybe the fact that the Jesse Smollett thing was allowed to mean what it meant was something. I don't know how many people are thinking Jesse Smollett needs to be listened to because of the larger story. But still, the fact is that at this point, whenever one of those particularly colorful, especially depressing, barbaric stories about racial abuse comes up, it's at the point where we are justified 
in being skeptical rather than just immediately thinking that's horrible. In other words, someone might say, believe black people. And to be honest, with these things, I think any halfway intelligent person can't help but think, no, no, frankly, really we kind of hold back and halfway believe these sorts of claims until more facts come in. I now, I'm more cynical about that than I ever thought I would be. And you and I've had our disagreements about the cops. For me, whenever it's about the cops, I think, all right, I'm on the quote unquote, the proper side now. But it's at the point where I now have been deceived too often. And that's well, I, don't, I frankly don't see the difference between the claim believe women and the claim believe black people. Uh, the value at stake is in the case of women, uh, uh, an abhorrence of sexual violence and uh, abuse, and the value at case uh, at stake in the case of blacks is uh, anti-racism, and uh, the claim is uh, the veracity of a report should depend upon the fact that it does or does not further our campaign against, in one case, sexual violence, in the other case, anti-racism, and I think it's wrong in both cases. The belief claim, the epistemic claim, what do I think is true? ought not to depend upon the normative position, I'm against the exploitation of women, I hate racism. The belief claim ought to depend upon an epistemic structure that assesses facts as best one can, that uses logic and deduction and inference. That's where what I know or don't know should come from. What I know or don't know should never come from what I feel or don't feel or from what I want or don't want. That's, that's just a category mistake, and it's just as big a mistake in the case of women as it is in the case of Blacks, in my humble opinion, there I said it. But I think there's something else that has to be said, John. Because we're and Gwen, this, this will have to be the end because I have to run Proctor an exam. But no ahead. problem. The thing that has to be said here, because we're going to get flack, is Sabrina Fulton is Trayvon Martin's mother. Tracy Martin is Trayvon Martin's father. In uh, February of 2012, they learned that their son is dead their beloved son, whatever his flaws or faults, okay? There's a trial, his killer gets off. Years go by. Now they are the subject of a financially ruinous lawsuit. First their son dies, then the killer of their son walks, and now somebody's trying to take everything they've got. A lot of people are gonna feel, regardless of the colors involved, that that's a deeply unjust evolution. Yeah circumstance and i think we need to acknowledge that we do glenn you know we need to do part two of this one let's do part and two so no problem. let's do part two very soon um i've got to run do this exam i wish i could just come back and start again but i have to go to a talk but let's keep this going because we're not done there's more to be said about can this. you get a better device than your iphone the next <laughs> time? <laughs> yes we'll do it on my ipad next time yes yes all right my friend uh signing off for now this was fun <laughs>